Hey, it's Mike here, and today the Glymphatic system, really the brain's detox system, which I would venture to say is the least known system of the body. You know, out on the internet there, you see a lot of videos about how to improve liver function, maybe even how to improve thyroid function, and on and on and on. But there's not a lot about how to improve your Glymphatic system, so we're gonna get into it, try to look at various lifestyle changes that you can make, and sort of little tricks and hacks. But with the asterisk of, with the available research that we have currently, I will say, because this is so new, which we'll get into, there is not enough data on this. However, we have some pretty good hints as to what might help, especially if it's harmless. This is the first time we will be citing some 2025 studies. Holy crap. You're gonna learn so much that by the end of this, you will be a glymphomaniac. No, that, that doesn't sound right. <laughs> we'll even get into some research on some more theoretical methods around things like posture and breathing and even head banging. Just get it manually flowing. <laughs> No, I'm totally joking about that one. And we're just gonna look at a ton of research on this topic, so let's just go. And we'll just dive right into what has been referred to as the good old brain drain, the cerebral siphon, the mind mop. Okay, I'll totally stop. No one ever refers to it as the noggin neatener. Come on, that's a good one. What's going on here? Well, to summarize this paper, it's a recently discovered waste clearance system that utilizes a unique system of perivascular channels, we will elaborate on those, formed by astroglial cells, which are really just the most common type of brain cell. It's more of a structural or metabolic support cell compared to neurons to promote efficient elimination of soluble proteins and metabolites from the central nervous system. The crazy part here, the glymphatic system was first described in 2012, so like 13 years ago. And that means that most people watching this video did not have the glymphatic system in their anatomy class in school. Now, what other systems are yet to be discovered? We don't even know. Hopefully we got most of them. Anyway, the name itself is glymphatic because it's similar to the lymphatic system in that it's a drainage system. We'll talk about the differences. And then the G is for glial in terms of glial cells. Those astrocytes are a type of glial glial cell, we're talking about brain cells. And yeah, well, the lymphatic system has its own specific drainage tubes. It's also clearing waste, similar in that sense. In this case, we actually have drainage in the perivascular space. We're talking about this space in your brain that is surrounding both arteries and veins. And so we have flow out that way. And you can see from this chart, really we have that fluid around those brain cells that can migrate into that perivascular space. It's hard to imagine how this really looks, but we have this nice black and white illustration, which I think does a good job. We have these sort of perivascular cells that hold open these channels, which yeah, go right around these arteries and veins. And what actually moves this liquid? What gets this flowing? Well, we have arterial pulsation. So when our heart beats, that creates a pressure and then can move things along in a directional way like the lymphatic system does. However, the lymphatic system has these little sort of check valves and the glymphatic system doesn't. From this paper, really the flow velocity in the perivascular space matches the peak velocity of arterial pulsation, providing microscopic evidence that arterial pulsation is a critical driver. But there's really two ways that fluid can get into these perivascular spaces and we have just these gaps where this interstitial fluid, little proteins, et cetera, can flow right in there. And then we also have almost like a tube hooked directly up from these astrocytes, those star-shaped brain cells that are again there for structure and for metabolic support. And they have these little receptors called AQP4 channels where basically on the end of their arms, they can let things into that perivascular space. You know, sort of like a little gate there. Anyway, the glymphatic system is super important in terms of a lot of different diseases, obviously neurodegeneration, brain diseases. One of them that dominates the conversation here is Alzheimer's disease because a lot of the Alzheimer's disease pathology is the buildup of these proteins, et cetera, that you don't want, whether it is amyloid beta or tau tangles. No, we want that stuff gone, and it is also the case that our glymphatic system becomes less effective as we age. And while mouse studies claim an 80% or more drop with aging, this study on humans shows a pretty clear drop in function from 50 to 80 years old. I would love to see younger people as well to compare though. And as we age, there's sort of this balance between our arteries, even just the artery size, as well as the perivascular space there. The perivascular space becomes too big, and that would make sense. There would be some pressure and flow issues. It wouldn't work as well. Or if your arteries become too big with 
with atherosclerosis. There can also be issues there. And as this study mentions, both fewer spaces and larger perivascular spaces predicted higher dementia risk and accelerated brain atrophy. Brain atrophy, something you really don't want, but also it could be a good band name. You can have it. Now, as this study mentions, it's associated with various things, even including MS or multiple sclerosis. And we also have a connection to traumatic brain injuries from this study. Now, compared to healthy controls, mild to moderate traumatic brain injury patients with and without cognitive impairment had a decreased, really, glymphatic system function index. And a worse index was associated with more cognitive impairment. And this is interesting because it can sort of be a cascading effect. You have a traumatic brain injury and then your glymphatic system becomes impaired and then you get more oxidative stress and neuroinflammation and then you can end up with more issues in the long term, at least according to this study. But I feel like you're getting a background. This is a pretty important system. It's all about flow here and really just the clearance of bad proteins or toxins, et cetera. So what can we actually do about it? Again, I wish we had a lot of randomized controlled human trials, each investigating each point I'm about to talk about, but we don't have that yet. However, we still crave knowledge. However, I will say there are entire reviews of the literature exploring different lifestyle factors and glymphatic function. And that brings me to the first area which you probably do associate with glymphatic flow if you are interested in this topic at all, and that is sleep. And we have multiple mice studies showing that sleeping can increase glymphatic flow by 60% or even double it. As this paper mentions, the glymphatic system is strongly correlated to sleep processes. Sleep helps the glymphatic system remove brain waste solutes. Astrocytes expand and contract to form channels for cerebral fluid to wash through the brain and eliminate waste. And in particular, it's the slow wave activity, non-REM deep sleep that seems to be most associated with that increase, which is further supported by how, again, the glymphatic system gets worse with age and how we get less of that particular type of sleep as we age. How does it work? Well, I'm gonna read you a really complicated but beautiful quote. Quote, during slow wave sleep, delta oscillations are nested in high voltage, slow oscillatory neuronal activity, causing large bundles of neurons to harmonize rhythmically and repetitively depolarizing over 20 to 30 seconds, end quote, which they go on to say increases flow and clearance. That was from a paper called The Sleeping Brain, and they go on to say that the neurotransmitter norepinephrine goes down when you sleep, and as a result actually expands this perivascular space, and then that allows more flow, which quote, causes the expansion of the extracellular space, decreasing resistance, and therefore increasing the rate of glymphatic clearance. And as this paper mentions, it appears that the glymphatic system is responsible for clearing nearly half of the beta amyloid from our brain. Where does the rest go? We'll never know. And in terms of sleep quality, it's no surprise that studies on insomnia show worse glymphatic clearance. And that actually is a study on 32 human beings. They had them jump into an MRI machine and then they measured that glymphatic index worse with insomnia, as you would guess. They measured their ability to clear out contrast, and I will say the results weren't insanely different. Now, the insomniacs might've been at 1230, while well, the normal people I were at 1,270, not insane. And another thing they started exploring was what sleeping position is best. You know, this is kind of a mechanical thing. How does moving around a body <laughs> affect things? And well, again, it was just in mice. They found that side sleeping was better than laying on your back. And back to the sleeping brain, quote, neurodegenerative patients spend a much larger percentage of time in the supine position, which is on their back, which suggests a connection between time in supine position and dementia. And Dr. Gregor of Nutrition Facts even covered that sleeping on your right side is slightly better than sleeping on your left side. This may maximize blood outflow from the brain. When we sleep on our right side, our right internal jugular vein, the main blood vessel in our neck, draining blood from the head, is wide open, and our left jugular is partially collapsed, and vice versa. Since most people have a dominant right jugular vein, sleeping on their right side might maximize brain drainage. But this is where I hit a major stumbling block in my research and had to challenge my own beliefs. <laughs> um, and that is this paper, which essentially said, hey, we measured this and we found that the clearance from the glymphatic system during sleep was worse than when they were awake in terms of mice. And even said that the deeper the sleep, the worse the clearance, which is the opposite of what other people found, like study after study has found. They argue that they were focusing more on actual clearance than flow rate. 
However, they still saw a decrease in flow when other studies have seen an increase in flow. And also we've seen particularly an increase in beta amyloid plaque clearance during sleep, et cetera. So this seems to be an outlier. Either that or there was something that we're missing, whether it was the size of the tracer or whatever, but let's move on to the next thing, the next area, and that is exercise. I know we're getting very novel here. <laughs> I didn't really see this topic make it into any of the glymphatic news. It's a big segment of the of the nightly news. <laughs> no. So I had to dig a little bit deeper and it does appear though that exercise is really good for your glymphatic system. One paper even posits that the glymph system could be the missing link between Alzheimer's and exercise. Sadly, the best study on this is again, a mouse study where they let mice run on a wheel. They love running on a wheel and then they measured glymphatic clearance and even the clearance of that beta amyloid and they found that it did increase in both cases. And they did this on aged mice, old mice, and they found that it reduced cognitive impairment as well. So, you know, hitting it from a couple sides. Next, there's the topic of diet. And this one is like, holy crap, there's almost no literature on this. Yeah, occasionally a study will mention that sleep habits and eating patterns uh, can significantly affect glymphatic activity with absolutely no reference. But from this 2020, study on the glymphatic system. They say, quote, as a risk factor for Alzheimer's disease, studies have demonstrated that long-term high fat diet could accelerate the deposition of amyloid beta in the brain. And in mice, a high fat diet directly impaired lymphatic function by lowering the activity of those AQP4 channels which they say is connected to lower beta amyloid clearance, again, connected to Alzheimer's. And from this meta-analysis, a high saturated fat intake increased the risk of Alzheimer's by 40% and doubled the risk of overall dementia, really with a plus 15% increased Alzheimer's risk for each four grams of saturated fat. So three tablespoons of butter per day would mean a 60% increased risk of Alzheimer's. It's all coming together. However, there are quite a few studies talking about general arterial health and the glymphatic system. And I think this is where diet comes in in a big way because we're talking about atherosclerosis and artery stiffness and LDL is causal to atherosclerosis when it is high. And it all ties together realizing that Alzheimer's is largely clogged brain arteries. It was first described as an atherosclerotic issue by Dr. Alzheimer's in 1908. And we have that recent Ornish trial on Alzheimer's, putting people on a plant-based diet, plus some light lifestyle changes like walking, and they saw improvements in various metrics, which is wild compared to the control group that just got worse. And we can see over and over again that people, you know, whether you're vegan or on a plant-based diet, have a lower level of that LDL or bad cholesterol. We have seen incredible results from the earlier Ornish trial on heart disease specifically with a 60% reduction in adverse events on people put on a plant-based diet and lifestyle changes, as well as Dr. Esselstyn's study putting people on a whole food vegan diet and really just seeing a collapse of adverse events over 12 years for people with severe disease. You know, we also see a vegan diet lowering inflammation markers. And so we have a few things working together here. It's just simple artery health, which again, you've got that artery and then you've got that perivascular space there. And so we're talking about better arterial function. And that brings me to something that many of you are aware of, and that is nitrates, dietary plant-based nitrates are the only ones that can help with arterial function, with endothelial function. And they do that through a complicated process of oral bacteria and digestion, turning that into nitric oxide. Again, dilating arteries, you can bomb your oral bacteria and see an increase in blood pressure, which is wild. And this is a situation where you also don't want blood pressure that is too high. We have a sort of demographic study seeing who has good glymphatic flow and who doesn't. And it turns out that men have worse glymphatic flow. We already knew that older people did but it also found that people with high blood pressure had worse flow as well. And, and what's this chart over here to the right about the DMV? What does the Department of Motor Vehicles have to do with anything? No, they're talking about deep medullary veins, which may degenerate with aging and are associated with worse lymphatic function and also become torturous, which perfectly describes the DMV. And from this study, yes, high blood pressure impairs glymphatic flow. Now we've seen over and over again that people on a vegan, again, or plant-based diet have lower levels of hypertension or high blood pressure, which again, very likely has to do with just the flexibility of the arteries, the overall artery health, et cetera. And in terms of inflammation, those APQ4, astrocyte little channels can be impaired by neuroinflammation as well. Another interesting one is just alcohol in general. I've been meaning to do an alcohol video with the Surgeon General's recommendation to put cancer labels <laughs> on alcohol. But we have some really interesting data here because yeah, well, high alcohol consumption seems to decrease flow in terms of mice models, I'm sorry. It also 
appears to improve it when you have a mild amount of alcohol, which to that I say, yeah, that is completely backed by studies like this one showing that a small amount of alcohol decreases your risk of dementia. Oh wait, sorry, uh, a study that was 10 times larger showed that any amount of alcohol was associated with more dementia. They say, quote, our findings suggested that there was no safe level of alcohol consumption for dementia. So for whatever reason, the body responding to poison or being suppressed in terms of just overall bodily activity, they saw in mice, in a certain case, a slight increase with a small amount of alcohol. I don't think it applies to humans and human disease. Now, I'm really worried that the biggest takeaway for some people is gonna be that the way to clear their glymphatic system is to take a tequila shot. <laughs> All right, now we're gonna get into even more experimental territory, and that has to do with like posture and breathing and meditation. Yes, there are peer-reviewed papers talking about this. <laughs> as this study mentions, head position also has an effect on amyloid beta clearance rate. Thus, something as simple as head position can have an effect on fluid dynamics in brain clearance. And it sort of makes sense if you kind of have a kinked neck or whatever, that could influence that arterial pulsation and perhaps lymphatic flow as a result, and as this paper even mentions. For example, in this category, even minor compression of the vena cava, which is a heart vein, may reduce cardiac stroke volume. And I'm not talking about a bad kind of stroke, I'm talking about the stroke of pumping that your heart does. And we actually do have a human study on this, sort of, and that is a study on about 20 people that implemented yogic breathing and then found that it increased the cerebral spinal fluid rate of movement. They say, quote, we observed immediate increase in cranially directed velocities of instantaneous cerebral spinal fluid, 16 to 28%, and respiratory cerebral spinal fluid, 60 to 118%, during four breathing patterns compared to spontaneous breathing with the greatest changes during deep abdominal breathing. That's kind of complicated and wild. And they say, you know, some of it could do with arterial pressure. Some might have to do with just overall like volume of the body pressure from the lungs. And then we have this other study mentioning that, that yeah, cerebral spinal fluid flow within the ventricle is driven by intrathoracic pressure changes associated with inhalation which is decreased during breath holding. And then finally on this topic, we have a study saying, hey, meditation could help here because we're talking about these slow wave brain patterns, which can be mimicked to an extent in meditation. But I do love how they just threw in a straight up quote, obviously <laughs> further research is needed. <laughs> and another one I've seen mentioned just in terms of lifestyle things you can do is to increase your intake of omega-3s, which increases clearance according to the study, whether we're talking about plant-based ALA or longer chain DHA that our body can convert or we can get from external sources, which really are all derived from algae. Even fish get it from algae. Of course, you can take the vegan algae supplement. So in the end, I know how you're probably feeling the lack of human data on the lymphatic system and interventions to help it is criminally low. But considering it's a system that was just discovered in 2012, really hypothesized about in 2012, I think it was really 2013, it has not been very long. And I think people are starting to now realize this is a really important system. We need to study it more. You now we've seen some studies on humans using that lymphatic flow index. I would love to just see actual humans laying down, sleeping, what is happening with their lymphatic flow in different types of sleep, deep, light, and then we can also put people in different positions and whatever, and then actually compare exercise in humans. I mean, come on, we can do this. And we might find some interesting answers that are unexpected, but I think we will likely find the expected answer, which is that in terms of neurodegeneration, exercise is amazing. You know, we've seen exercise associated with 38% lower Alzheimer's risk and on and on. And we, so yeah, let me know down below what you think about the glymphatic system. Any of the points here that I maybe missed, any insights, ideas, I'm, obsessed with this now. I researched it for way too long. And as usual, feel free to like, subscribe, support me on Patreon, all that good stuff. And I'll see you in the next one. Thanks for watching.